Um, so hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming to the final webinar um, of the NSTS uh, kind of spring series. So tonight we've got a single best answer session, which will be fully interactive um, with a poll function. So hopefully it'll be a really good experience for everyone to learn something new. And we're really excited to have Mr. Nabir Hambali with us today. Um, he's a um, surgical trainee in Yorkshire at the moment, and he does a lot of teaching. So it's going to be a really great webinar. Um, I'll hand over to you, Nabir. If you need me to move on slides, so if you can't control them, just let me know. Okay, will do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, hey, guys. Uh, my name is Nabir. I work in general surgery. So we've got 10 questions to go through today. Uh, we'll start, we'll read the questions initially, then we'll give you some time to answer them, and then we'll go through the explanation of the topic, and then we can answer any questions at the end. So let's start. So the first question is, we have a 69-year-old male who presents to A&E with a worsening of diffuse abdominal pain over the past two days and re recurring bilious vomiting. It's not been able to pass any inflators over the past two days. Her abdomen is distended with tympanic sounds are heard on the auscultation and CT shows a transition zone in the mid with dilated small bowel proximal to this. Which of the following is the most common cause of this presentation? And we have five options there, so we'll start the poll for that. Okay, shall we share the results of the poll? Um, so, as you can see, most of you have chosen a previous laparotomy quite some time ago, uh, which is the um, correct answer if we show the next slide. Um, a lot of you have mentioned hysterectomy as well. Hysterectomy would have been also um, an option, but not if it was done in the quite um, in the recent past. It would have been kind of some time ago. Um, and diverticular disease um, is incorrect. We'll go through a bit more thoroughly about diverticular disease later on in the lecture. So um, we'll start off with by showing two x-rays about what he expects in pictures of bowel obstruction. And I know there's quite a lot of us, but between you just have a look. So one of them shows a picture of large bowel obstruction and one of them shows a picture of a small bowel obstruction. Um, and then if you take a, a second between yourself to try and guess which one's which, and just have a think as well. If you look at the picture on the left, uh, there are some small uh, artifacts in the x-rays. If you can see them like small clips thing, just have a think about that, what they might be as well. Um, so uh, we'll go to the next slide as well. So we'll talk firstly about small bowel obstruction in the picture that, and the pictures that was the picture on the left. So the next slide, please. So any patient who presented with small bowel obstruction uh, the picture, they're more likely to present with nausea and vomiting as the small bowel is more proximal to the stomach, to the upper GI. Uh, they would have a picture, a picture of the abdominal distension, abdominal pain, and they're likely to report not passing any wind or having any passing any bowel motions. Next slide. So when we look at them in clinical examination, when you start, for example, an exam Oscar scenario, or you look at the end of the bed, you're looking for any scars that they might have in the abdomen that might show evidence of any abdominal surgery. In the scenario that we had, it was a previous laparotomy, so they would have a, a long midline incision. Um, they would have, uh, be worried about um, lack of bowel sounds or high pitch bowel sounds and empty rectum on examination. So, if they are tender, or there's pictures of kind of localized guarding or peritonism, then it's likely that the picture has progressed and you are worried about a perforation as well, okay? We need to be worried about a small bowel obstruction and most of the times because it is, um, it can progress, okay? Uh, we'll talk a bit, a little bit more about the management and how we approach it. 
but initially you are worried because um, if the bowel is obstructed, it's likely to get more dilated and that dilatation is likely to compromise the blood supply, breed to ischemia, nutritional necrosis. And then as we talked about in our examination findings, we can find pictures of peritonitis where there might be evidence of perforation as well. And then a picture, there's you can see evidence of, um, of necrotic bowel, especially the one on the right. Next slide, please. To think about the causes of small bowel obstruction, it's best to think about things that we can have from outside the bowel, things that we have in the bowel wall, and things that we can have inside the bowel wall. So the commonest things, small bowel obstruction, is we always think about uh, adhesions. And causes of adhesions, one of the commonest causes is previous um, abdominal surgery. So in this case, the patient had had um, bowel surgery quite some time ago. Obviously, there was the other uh, option of only hysterectomy a week ago, but that was too, that history was too short. Um, other things is kind of a twist. Um, the small bowel, which is obviously not as common as other types of hernia, but kind of an intraabdominal hernia causing a twist in the bowel. Things that are related to the bowel wall is anything really that can cause an inflammation or thickening in the bowel wall. And when it comes to small bowel, is we ought to think about things like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and but more specifically, we're thinking about Crohn's because um, it affects the small bowel more frequently. And things that arise obviously from the bowel wall, but might end up obstructing the inside of the bowel, are things like malignancy and other things like gallstones, uh, causing gallstone eyeless and foreign bodies as well. Next slide, please. So when you have any patient that you suspect that they may have a small bowel obstruction, and really this applies to anyone with um, a lot of people with acute um, abdomen, so you need to do basic investigations like blood tests. And um, things you're looking at um, in the blood test is, for example, thinking like, if you're thinking about malignancy, thinking about whether they have a, a, low, a, a chronic anemia, a low hemoglobin and a low MCV. Uh, thinking about other things uh, like causes of pseudo obstruction, which would be under our differential before we get more investigations done, is thinking about whether there are any electrolyte imbalances that can cause this pseudo obstruction. And then you can start build up the rest of your investigations, getting some imaging. Start off with the basic imaging, like x rays, doing an abdominal film, which might diagnose the small bowel obstruction, and a chest x ray, which you always, in general surgery, try and get as an erect film, try and exclude uh, uh, under the diaphragm. But really, the definitive diagnosis, we're going to get it with a, a CT scan, which you'll find is a lot it's the case in a lot of cases in general surgery. There's a CT abdomen pelvis with contrast. Um, and there is a contrast swallow test that can also show us, um, can show us a definitive diagnosis as well. Next slide, please. So, as with any patient who is unwell, you assess them as an A, A to E approach. Uh, but essentially, they start off with, you know, you see a small bowel obstruction, common things being common, if they've had previous surgery and suspect adhesion or obstruction, is that you try the drip and suck technique, which is basically make them kneel by mouth, put a Riles tube in, and leave it on free drainage, uh, urinary catheter, and monitor the fluid balance very accurately and closely. And and you need to really monitor the fluid input and output. And you monitor the picture quite closely and you look for any evidence of compromise to the bowel, for example, looking for things like high lactate, any evidence of ischemia under CT, which might, might make you make the surgical intervention more urgent. Obviously, most adhesional small bowel obstruction does settle with the drip and suck technique, um, but you, keep, you need to keep moving uh, the things closely, and if they don't settle, they're likely to end up with surgical intervention. Next slide. So the other one, the picture that was in the x-rays that was on the right was the picture of large bowel obstruction. Uh, and large bowel obstruction, kind of, we need to treat um, more uh, urgently because it can progress, especially if we have a competent ileus equal valve. Next slide. The picture might be... Um, <clears throat> quite similar. However, the nausea and vomiting can present a bit later. So if you now you think about large bowel obstruction, it's the lower GI tract. So it's quite some distance from the upper GI tract because of vomiting. Next slide. 
um, the causes, uh, you can think about them in a similar way, uh, but essentially when you have a picture of large bowel obstruction, the number, th number one thing you need to think about is tumours, because large bowel tumours are more commoner than small bowel. You need to be worried about whether there's a tumour. Things like a stricture. A stricture can develop secondary to um, inflammation, and commonly we see it in the large bowel when patients have had repeated episodes of diverticulitis and it has um, developed a thickening of the bowel wall and should cause the narrowing. Things like a volvulus, um, hernias as well, and also adhesions, however, less frequently than small bowel obstruction. Next slide. The uh, management, uh, start off similar treatment to small bowel obstruction, is doing supportive things, um, giving them nail by mouth, making sure they have enough painkillers, antimitics, IV fluids, catheter, and things like that. If it is a volvulus, you treat the volvulus. Sigmund volvulus is treated via decompression, insertion of the flatus tube. However, if it is a malignancy, the definitive intervention is likely to be a surgical intervention. But obviously, that will depend on the de uh, extent of the disease and depending on the fitness of patient for the surgical intervention. Um, that is normally decided in an MDT setting, and it's quite really important to note that now because a lot of the decisions that we have to take in surgery are when not to operate and when not to offer surgical treatment, when to offer other types of treatment, and palliative stenting can play a part in large bowel tumors. Next question, I think, is now. So we'll move on to the next question. So we have a 68-year-old male who presents to the general practice. Uh, practice with a two-month history of fatigue and weight loss. They've noticed that he's opening his bowel more frequently and he has no past medical history or family history of note. Physical examination reviews cachexia and conjunctival pallor. The patient is referred for urgent colonoscopy which reveals an exophytic mucosal lesion in the descending colon. The biopsies has shown adenocarcinoma and the histopathology reveals that his left part spread to three lymph nodes, regional lymph nodes. There's no evidence of metastatic spread. Which of the following management plans is this patient most likely to benefit from? So we'll start the poll. Um, okay, and if you could share the results of the poll. So most of you have voted for left hemicolectomy plus post-operative chemotherapy, which I think is the correct answer. If we go to the next slide. Yeah, and if we go to the next slide, please, as well. So we'll talk a bit about colorectal cancer, which is one of the uh, commoner causes of large bowel obstruction, as we've already mentioned. So the risk factors. So essentially when you're thinking about colorectal cancer as one of your differential, or you have a patient who presents with abdominal pain and suspect bowel obstruction, you need to think about um, family history. That's quite important. It's a risk factor that we know about. And there's a risk factor whether it's because secondary to the hereditary syndromes, but also to uh, bowel cancer not caused by the hereditary syndromes. Uh, the obvious things like smoking, um, and there's also um, things like previous exposure to radiation and inflammatory, but there's been a link also with inflammatory bowel disease as well. Next slide, please. There's two ways when we can think about bowel cancer and how we can uh, classify it or and to describe the extent of the disease. It started off with historically with the Duke's classification, which is an A to D classification, and it's quite easier to follow than the next one that we'll go through. Uh, so A is when it's just limited to the bowel wall, B is ex extended to the, through the bowel wall, so in this scenario we know it did extend through the bowel wall, so it would be B, and there's been some regional lymph node spread, so it's also C, so it's C, but there was no distant metastasis, so it's not D. Okay, the next, the more commoner one used, which we use uh, to describe um, 
the disease you'll see it used a lot more often in multidisciplinary meetings and they try and use it to describe the extent of the disease radiologically uh, and later on definitively more when they've done the resection as well uh, the surgical intervention um, so it stands for tumor node metastasis tnm and um, really depending on the extent of the disease you need to kind of follow each one as a tumor, depending on the actual tumor, you know, the lymph node spread and metastasis distance spread. Generally, with bowel cancer patients with uh, lymph node spread, they would benefit from chemotherapy post, um, um, post resection, just because it helps prevent recurrence. Uh, radiotherapy has a role in colorectal cancers, more when it's uh, rectal um, tumors. Next slide, please. Um, thanks to more specific investigations for bowel cancer. So um, when you kind of, these kind of, you tend to book them when you've got suspicion of bowel cancer. So people who've got like change of bowel habits, they're elderly, they've had some weight loss, or they've had kind of some PRBs as well. Think about an endoscopy test. Because to do the endoscopy test is try and visualize if there are any lesions, take any biopsies, and to get a histological tissue diagnosis via colonoscopy. If they're frail and would not tolerate an endoscopy, you think about doing a CT colonoscopy. And then if you have a stronger suspicion from either of those two tests that they have a cancer, a bowel cancer, then you think about doing the staging CT body, which is scan the rest of the body. If you think you have a rectal mass, you think about doing a pelvic MRI. And there's a CAA test, which is a simple blood test, which gives you an idea. However, obviously it's not raised in all cases. Next, please. Quite aware this slide. Unfortunately, there's only these do come up, I think, in your exams at uh, levels. And unfortunately, there's only one way to know them, which is just to learn them, unfortunately. Common things between them, which makes things a bit easier, uh, the, between the hereditary uh, familial colorectal cancer, uh, it tends to be autosomal dominant. Um, things that I think come up in your exams is knowing which gene causes them. Uh, and just to note with FAP or familial adenomatous polyposis, you tend to offer those patients prophylactic um, uh, proctocolectomies because uh, almost nearly all of them will get bowel cancer in the future. Okay, and off note as well that um, I think you guys need to familiarize yourself is that HNPCC tends to lynch syndrome tends to be associated with other cancers like gastric and denitral cancers as well. Okay, next slide please. Next question I think is. So you are asked to examine a 69 year old male patient on the ward. You find that there's a stoma in the right iliac fossa with liquid contents and it's pouted and two ends of the bowel are visible. You also notice a number of laparoscopic port incisions which look relatively recent. Which of the following surgical procedures is consistent with these examination findings? We can start the poll please. So in this question, we'll talk about different operations that you can do for colorectal cancers. Okay, that's great. We can stop the time there. So uh, most of you, 66% have said anterior resection with the temporary lupilostomy, which is the correct answer. I think, Hannah, if you show us. So I think some of you have done abdominal perineal and we'll go through why that's not the correct answer. So if you go to the next slide. So we'll start off with by talking difference between hilostomy and colostomy. And this table kind of sums up the main things really. Hilostomy tend to be on the right side. Uh, and more commonly, iolostomy, you'll have some, obviously can be end and can be latent in the right iliac fossa. The contents is, uh, because obviously they're higher up the GI tract than a, um, a colostomy. Because if you remember the large uh, colon or the large bowel job is to absorb the water. So the contents will be more solid. While in the iolostomy, they haven't, they haven't gone through the large bowel. So the um, 
significant amounts of water have not been uh, absorbed from the contents. Um, Iostomy has to be spouted, essentially kind of the end where the pee is coming out is kind of coming out a bit, little bit far away from the skin and essentially to protect the skin. Colostomy can be flush, flushed uh, and just because. Um, and colostomy, you could have leap or end, but most of the time they tend to be end uh, colostomies as well. Okay, next question, next slide, I mean. So just to go, I think some of you have done, said I've done a perineal. So, in this picture, you can see kind of different resections that you can do. A lot of them are kind of obvious. A right hemicolectomy if the cancer is on the right side, left hemicolectomy if the cancer is on the left side. Subtotal colectomies and uh, proctocolostomies, they have a role to be done in tumors. However, for example, subtotal colectomies tends to be done frequently for, and panproctative be frequently for patients with ulcerative colitis. So we do a subtotal colectomy if there is a plan to do an ilioanal pouch later on. And pan proctor, for example, if the disease has progressed or you think there's no option to do the ileo anal pouch. The difference between abdominal perineal and anterior resection is that abdominal perineal is done for tumors which are a lot lower down. Essentially, it's a lot of lower down that you need to take out the anus. And the patients would end up with an end colostomy. So all patients who have an abdominal perineal resection would end up having an end colostomy. Um, anterior resections can be high or low, that's just depending on the site of the tumour. And most people, they tend to be joined up and don't have a stoma. However, depending on the patient's age, comorbidities, and sometimes just the difficulty of the procedure at the time of the operation, there can be a decision to form a stoma. For example, during the COVID pandemic, because um, there, there was an approach in some places, um, uh, because of ways of kind of, uh, if we do a join between the two bits of bowel, um, and then we don't do a stoma, then there might be a leak, and then we expose the patients and the staff to another risk of coronavirus, because we have to take the patient to theatre again to deal with the leak and form a stoma. Some surgeons were um, uh, offering to do a prophylactic stoma, just to prevent them going to theatre again, okay? Um, and so it's just give you an idea of the different people's approaches, but really a lot of the time it's decided depending on the patient comorbidities and the difficulty of the procedure at the time and worry about leak or not between the joint that is made. Next slide. So the next question is, so we have a 55, I think we're moving away from cancers now. So a 55 year old female patient presents to the emergency department with pain in the left lower quadrant associated with nausea. She has no past medical history of note, but prior to the episode, she does report occasional constipation. On physical examination, she is pyrexial and there's tenderness on palpation in the left lower quadrant. Temperature is 37.7, hemodynamically stable, otherwise urine dipstick is negative, which of the following investigation findings is consistent with the most likely diagnosis? The poll, please. Thank you. We'll do 45 seconds and then close the poll. Okay, great. So most of you have said the contrast any measures multiple outpatient sigmoid colon, and imagine for most of you have that the most likely this is a diverticular disease or complicated by diverticulitis. So go to the next slide. So um, common things that um, mistake that we all make is mix up these terms together, and you'll see that I've made this mistake initially in the slides, which was one of the things that I have corrected initially but I can't share my copy of the slides. So we've got diverticular disease and diverticular disease essentially when patients are symptomatic from multiple diverticuli or diverticulosis, okay? And the symptoms that they get are things like a slight change in bowel habits, like constipation and the odd pain in the left iliac fossa, 
and some people might get episodes of PR bleed. Okay. And the diverticular, diverticular diverticulosis is essentially the eye patching in the um, um, in the bowel wall. And if they are true, they involve all the layers of the bowel. Okay. When these eye patchings get inflamed, that, that is kind of progress into something called diverticulitis. Okay, and if we go to the next slide, there's a diagram that illustrates the diverticulum, diverticulum, and we can see that it involves all the layers of the bowel wall. Okay, so in terms of how we manage it, and if you go to the next slide, and it should say diverticular disease, not diverticulosis. Um, so essentially, a lot of patients will not have any trouble with them, so we don't do anything. However, patients who are having some troublesome diverticular disease tend to advise them on increasing their fiber intake, hydration, and regular pain relief. Okay. However, if it gets onto diverticulitis, we'll talk about the next slide. Um, it can be, it's quite variable, and really, it's variable because of depending on the severity of diverticulitis, the progression. And initially, if one kind of so, a type of treatment fails, then you kind of progress to the other one. So quite recently, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that we should manage diverticulitis conservatively. So even though if there's some evidence of inflammation, if it's mild, we manage it without kind of antibiotics. We manage it with the hydration, increased fiber intake, and regular pain relief, as we suggested for the symptomatic diverticular disease. However, the mainstay kind of treatment that is being used is that medical, we do give some fluids, give some antibiotics and monitor the patient, make sure that the tendency is settling, okay? That is really the mainstay medical treatment. Okay. If things progress or if they're presented quite severely, for example, um, diverticulitis can progress into diverticular perforation and diverticular abscesses. Surely that, that needs some sort of intervention in a lot of cases, okay? Or we could think about the diverticulitis, which did not settle with intravenous antibiotics. We know sometimes we even start with oral antibiotics, but if we convert it to intravenous and they're still not settling and pain is getting worse, then we worry about a perforation happening and then we think about surgical intervention. In terms of the things and type of interventions that we can do, there's two things. It's that we either think about um, a surgical uh, definitive surgery, in a lot of cases because diverticular disease affects the sigmoid colon, we think about doing a Hartman's procedure. Or if there's kind of an abscess or a patient might not be fit for surgery, we think about intervention or radiology and things like draining the abscess uh, under uh, radiological guidance like ultrasound and things like that and leaving a drain in. And that will all depend on the clinical picture and how it does, how, how it progresses. Okay. Next slide. So uh, I'm quite aware of the time, but I think the questions will kind of explanations will can become a bit shorter as we go on. So it should be okay. So next question is what we have a 55 year old male patient presents to the emergency department with a two hour history of severe pain in his right leg. The patient has a past medical history um, of um, rheumatic heart disease. The patient is a non-smoker. On physical examination, the right calf is pale and cold and tender to touch. The dorsalis pedis, posterior tibia and popliteal pulses are impalpable on the right side. Capillary refill time, the right toe is four seconds. The patient is unable to move their toes on the right side and there's reduced sensation with touch over the dorsum of the right foot. Examination of left lower limb shows no abnormalities. The radio pulse is irregularly irregular. Which of the following is the most appropriate definitive management? If we could start the poll, please. Thank you. Okay, so uh, most of you have chosen surgical endolectomy. So in this patient, uh, we know that they've got a 
some sort of um, surgical emergency in the leg. Um, they've got atrial fibrillation because we know regular regular pulse, so it's most likely we've got an emboli that we need to do an embolectomy for to try and rescue the leg. So they've got an acute limb ischemia. Other people have mentioned IVF and streptokinase. They can have a role in the initial workup, but in terms of definitive management to try and solve this problem is surgical embolectomy. Okay, next slide. So um, you think about acute, less than two weeks, limb ischemia is when you have hyperperfusion. So when you have a severe symptomatic hyperperfusion of a limb for less than two weeks, you've got to, to think about acute limb ischemia. Next slide. So in the question, we were shown the six Ps, the patient's, uh, the pulselessness that is painful, pale, paralysis, paresthesia, and perishing glucose. If it's, these symptoms tend to start with uh, pain, reduced pulses, um, and then kind of progress more severely into the key uh, complete paresthesia and paralysis that's seem to be later signs. Okay, next slide. So the causes are mainly either thrombosis or embolism. Basal spasm is meant to be on a new line, apologies. Um, other causes are the basal spasm or external vascular compromise. So um, the main ones that you guys probably need to know about are the thrombosis and embolism. And then the next, I think the next slide we'll talk about the management of either of them. Oh, so we'll start off with how you manage the patient with acute limp ischemia. So uh, is an emergency, as we said, kind of with the small bowel suction, you use your ATE approach to manage any patients with these acutely unwell. So how are we breathing circulation, stability and exposure? So, um, make sure that they are on oxygen. We have some sort of ischemia, hyperperfusion, they'll need fluid resuscitation and pain relief. Okay. Um, think about kind of, uh, you need your blood test. And theory you're thinking blood test is as a basic investigations, but also you need to be thinking this patient is likely to need an intervention. I need to know their coagulation, coagulation screen, and need to, need, to, need to do a group and save as well. A venous blood cast, because you're thinking about hyperfusion, you're checking the lactate, we think they have any factors of acidosis, ECG to diagnose the uh, atrial fibrillation. And obviously thinking about depending where you are, are you on the ward, are you part of the emergency department team, you need to involve the vascular team early because we need to get this patient to a definitive intervention. And they would be able to advise you in terms of what intravenous treatment to start, um, such as the heparin, and keeping the patient note by mouth. Next. So if it's emboli, you need to do an embolectomy as soon as possible. Thinking about thrombosis. So thrombosis uh, in the acute, it's unlikely to present acute suddenly. A thrombosis is kind of a buildup. Uh, you'll need to, so it's likely to be done more in the elective setting. So you do some NGO, you do some imaging to try and see where the occlusion is and then you can plan. We'll talk about the different surgical things that you can do a bit later on. Um, however, if you do have complete ischemia, then taking out a thrombus is going to be quite difficult. It's like a patient is just going to need an urgent bypass surgery. Okay, um, doing things like uh, imaging things like that is just going to delay the definitive management, and you might end up uh, risking losing the leg or more complications as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, we'll talk about a bit more about vascular in another question. So we'll talk a bit more about colorectal again now. So we have a 27 year old male patient presents to the general practitioner with an anal mucus discharge associated with anal discomfort. He has a past medical history of Crohn's disease. On physical examination, there's an external opening located anteriorly at two o'clock, approximately 1.5 centimeters from the rectum. Which of the following accurately describes the location of the internal opening of the fistula? 
Okay. So, uh, so I think that we've got kind of a split between um, whether it would be a curved tract or a straight tract um, that both people have said at two o'clock. So this question is concerned about good cells rule. And we know fistulas are related to Crohn's disease and they can be quite symptomatic and uncomfortable for patients like presenting with things like mucus and they can progress into abscesses and things like that that might need definitive procedures as well. So if you go to the, I think the best thing is to go to the next slide and show the diagram and then we'll be able to explain. So the top, unfortunately, is posterior. So if you imagine the top is the kind of, and the bottom is the anterior part. So if the fistula opening is anterior to the transverse anal line, essentially in this picture is the lower half, most scenarios it will be straight. Okay, so in this scenario it was at two o'clock, so it will be straight to two o'clock. There is an exception, unfortunately, and the exception is if it is more than three centimeters, then it would follow a curved path, and normally that curved path would take it to the midline, okay, to um, six o'clock position internally. Posteriorly, which is the top half of the diagram, things are a little bit easier as they are a lot more consistent. It's a curved path to the midline to six o'clock. Okay, so in the question, obviously, good sales rule is some just to describe something that happens commonly and it's not going to be every single time. In the question, the position is two o'clock, it is anterior and it is 1.5 centimeters. So the exception anteriorly is only if it's over three centimeters. So it would follow a straight line to two, to two o'clock, okay? I hope that's all right. We can go through a bit later on if people want us to go through. Okay, let's go to the next question. So we have a 70 year old male who presents to the general practitioner with a one month history of a lump in his right groin associated with discomfort. The patient has no past medical history of note that smokes 10 cigarettes per day. On physical examination, there's a large lump in the right groin lying superior and medial to the pubic cubicle. The lump is present when standing, but not when lying. Which of the following is the most appropriate management? Okay, if we close the poll. So I think most of you have said A, which is laparoscopic mesh repair. Um, and obviously the second top answer is E, which is watchful waiting. Okay, so I'll address E first. So we've got a patient who, they are 70, uh, but we know that they have no past medical history. Obviously they are smoker of 10 cigarettes a day, which is significant and needs to be considered. But apart from that, we don't have anything that would make us think that they shouldn't have the surgery, okay? So if they are symptomatic and they are suffering because of the hernia, we would offer them repair. Now, the next things to discuss is um, whether we do laparoscopic or open mesh repair. Obviously, if we have two small hernias, inguinal hernias, it's quite straightforward. You think about, we'll just do laparoscopic, it's easier. One procedure, you do both things. Otherwise, if you do inguinal, you ought to think we're not really gonna do both at the same time. We're gonna do, and we're gonna do them at two different procedures and things like that, so we do laparoscopic. The question becomes raised, obviously, when, um, if it's only unilateral on one side, are you going to do it laparoscopic or are you gonna do it um, 
open, okay? The only thing that will point you in this question that you should do it open is that it does say it's quite, it's quite a large lump, okay? And essentially, if it's quite large and things like that, then you'd be more keen to do it open repair. I appreciate a lot, of, most of you have said laparoscopic. You're not, uh, I can't say you're incorrect. It's just kind of in the question, we tried to point it out towards that you would go down the open route rather than do the laparoscopic route. Okay. Shall we go to the next slide? So uh, the question, it tells us superior media, so if you think about, um, um, uh, think about um, inguinal hernias. If it's inferior and lateral, think about femoral hernias. And obviously they're at a higher risk of strangulation. So inguinal hernias, you need to try and differentiate between indirect and direct. Direct tends to be more in the elderly, indirect tends to be in the younger population. So indirect, because they are coming out through the deep brain, they're following kind of with the cord structures. So they're more likely to go to the scrotum in males. Okay, with direct because it's an abnormality or not abnormality, a defect in the posterior wall, so it's, it's unlikely to go all the way down to the scrotum. Okay, the indirect is a can you, um, imagine if they're going through the deep ring, um, so it's kind of quite narrow, they're more likely to strangulate. However, the direct because they're going through a defect of uh, posterior abdominal wall, which have kind of might have formed over the years, is they're more readily to strangulate as well. Okay. Next question. Okay, so you are the FY1 on gastroenterology ward. Fifty-three year old alcoholic is being managed on an acute with an acute episode of pancreatitis after drinking two bottles of whiskey two days ago. Despite adequate management, he begins to deteriorate. You take some blood tests and an arterial blood gas. Which of the following is the poorest prognostic indicator for pancreatitis? And I think the poll has already started. Okay, so most of you have said uh, the low calcium of 1.95, and you are right because as we're following the calcium criteria, that would score, um, as we can see on the next slide. So we'll talk a bit about pancreatitis. So the particular classical criteria is one of the commonly used uh, predictors of severity of pancreatitis, and essentially, if you score three or more, you have to think of whether this patient needs to go to intensive care or you get least involved in intensive care. And in this scenario, the sodium calcium is slightly low, so less than two. Um, we also, a lot of the, now the clinical practice is kind of, is moving towards monitoring the C reactive protein, the CRP. Um, so um, if I was to rewrite the question, I would write the CRP a lot lower because it is used as a predictor of kind of severity, but we're looking more of the trend of the CRP. So that in more practical clinical practice, the CRP is used quite frequently these days, okay? And the mnemonic is quite easy to, uh, to follow because it's just as well as the word uh, pancreas. So I'll go to the next slide. Causes, uh, there's a long list. Two things need to be aware of. It's either cold stones and alcohol or can be iatrogenic as well, kind of course. Um, so far, the ones, the ones, the rare ones that I have seen, I've seen pancreatitis secondary to uh, a recent use of prednisolone to steroids, I've seen it after an ERCP. The other ones, and I've seen hypertriglyceridemia as well. 
haven't seen the other ones yet, but never say never. But the two commonest ones essentially that you need to be aware of when we see them most frequently are gallstones and alcohol. Okay, next slide. And this is a slide just for you guys, just a list of examples of the different medications that can cause pancreatitis. Next slide, please. So pancreatitis, how we'd present, it'd be typical epigastric pain, sharp stabbing, sometimes goes through to the back. Obviously, uh, don't think about kind of, uh, need to have a wide differential for epigastric pain. Think about a lot of a range of things that can happen in the abdomen. We ought to think about uh, uh, AAAs. We ought to also to think about cardiorespiratory causes. So myocardial infarctions can also present with epigastric pain. So anybody who presents with epigastric pain need to have a very wide differential. But things that will point you more towards pancreatitis if they've got if it's like vomiting, recent history of alcohol, whether you know that they've had um, gallstones or if there's any drugs that might induce pancreatitis from the history that you take. Next slide. Um, anyone? We'll ask you guys a bit later on if you know what this sign is, but essentially it's a sign of kind of um, bruising, which is quite uh, indicative of pancreatitis, so it tends to be quite severe. And later on, we'll ask you a bit guys later on about the sign. <laughs> Next slide. So blood. So essentially the diagnostic um, test is um, looking at amylase or more recently we're using glycase a lot more frequently um, and essentially if it's elevated a lot of textbooks don't say three but really it's time it's four or more the amylase needs to be quite high the more sensitive and specific test is lipase okay we do an erect chest x-ray to rule out other causes for the gastric pain thinking about perforated to be ulcers and things like that and um, there is a role for imaging. However, in the acute, for initially in the first one or two days, the patient presents pancreatitis, um, and you have a, quite a diagnostic blood test, a lipase or amylase of pancreatitis, you do not need to do an imaging like a CT scan and initially. Things like you might do is an ultrasound scan to look for gold stains. However, if the pancreatitis does, spread, um, does progress clinically and you're thinking about whether about complications of pancreatitis, such as necrotizing pancreatitis, and later on, further down the line, thinking about things like pseudocysts, then you might think about doing a scan. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. We have a 60-year-old male man who present, patient who presents to the general practitioner um, uh, with a three month history of crampy pain in his calves when walking, worse than the left calf. The pain is relieved when he stops walking. There's a past medical history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Physical examination lower limbs are pale and the dorsalis pedis. Pulse is slightly diminished bilaterally. Power sensation in the lower limbs are normal. And the ankle break or pressure index is 0.6 in the left and 0.7 in the right lower limb. Which of the following is the most appropriate management plan? Okay, so massive view of chosen D and looking at the answers is that all of them need some sort of exercise. The question is whether which antiplatelet do we use and to induce clopidogrel and what does statin we need to use? Essentially, uh, we've already diagnosed and that, with, that they have the certain disease that we're going to talk about essentially and we've moved on from that primary prevention to secondary prevention. So we need to talk, they need to be on the higher dose of the statin. That's why it is B. Um, so, so essentially now we're going to talk about uh, chronic limp ischemia. Next slide. So um, 
commonest cause is atherosclerosis. And uh, it's because that you could have um, a narrowing of the arteries, okay? Risk factors are your typical cardiovascular risk, like smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, high cholesterol, and lack of exercise and obesity. Next slide, please. The symptoms is that, uh, typical symptoms of chronic lipid ischemia is that the patient is, um, when they're walking, they get kind of some pain in the legs and then at rest, that pain kind of eases off, okay? Uh, when moving that pain at rest and then kind of moving towards critical lymph ischemia. The signs are as well described in the question. So you have a slightly cold leg, might get complicated with some ulcers um, because of the hyperperfusion of the lower limbs, the poor healing of the wounds, and the pulses are slightly diminished. Next question. The investigations that we do, so the Quite specific test is the ankle brachial pressure index, and essentially looking at the ratio of the blood pressure between the ankle and the normal blood pressure measurements. And if it's low, then you've got some a sign of a, a, a limb ischemia. Um, the other investigation is more targeted towards your cardiovascular risk factors assessment. And essentially, the ones that we talked about, things like diabetes, so you check the blood glucose. Uh, high cholesterol to so check their lipids, um, doing a heart trace and checking the basic bloods and blood pressure as well to manage if they have anything like blood pressure, if they have anything like hypertension. Next slide, please. Um, just the range of the ankle break or pressure index to know. So if it's less than five, you tend to call it severe. Okay. And if it's higher than normal, then you're thinking about diabetes, thinking of the vascular walls. Okay, next slide. So I'm rushing slightly, I'm just aware of the time. So there are different imagings that you can do. Um, can be ultrasound based, MRI based or CT based. And essentially, the test they're mainly doing is to get a picture of the arterial tree and where you have the narrowing, where you have the obstruction, okay? That's the main reason that you are doing them. And that is uh, to look at the degree of the narrowing, um, how significant it is, and also that these images would be used whether you're going ahead to plan any surgical intervention that you might do later on. Next slide, please. In terms of your management, it tends to be three folds. So the first thing that we already talked about, I've mentioned a few times. So we know that the risk factors are mainly the ones that also relate to kind of vascular risk factors. So the initial part of the management, the medical part of the management is managing the, the cardiovascular risks. So giving them an empty platelets, managing their cholesterol, managing their blood sugars, and um, any hypertensives they might need if they have blood pressure and stopping smoking, okay? The second part, which is the next slide, is managing their uh, pain. So make sure that they have appropriate analgesia, essentially just to um, the quality of life. And the third part is when we come to surgical um, management. And the options are, there's a, depending on the extent of the atherosclerosis or thrombosis, and think about a revascularization. And that can be through um, the vascular interventions, or we could think about bypass surgery as well. And at the end of the spectrum, in terms of surgical intervention, you need to think about amputation. Um, yeah, next slide. Okay, next question. Uh, so we've got two quick questions at the end. So the cystic artery is most commonly a branch of 
Okay, so most of you have answered the um, correct answer, which is the right hepatic artery. So a lot of you have also answered the common hepatic. There are a lot of variation on how the cystic artery, however, in most commonly, as the question states, is, is it from the right hepatic artery. The next question, we have a diagram to try and illustrate that. So um, we can see the cystic artery is a branch from the right hepatic, which is a branch from the um, common, uh, from the main hepatic artery. And um, we can see the origin is that these arteries all originate from the celiac uh, axis, or in this diagram is called the celiac um, trunk. Cystic artery is quite an important uh, landmark because thinking about um, its importance in laparoscopic cholecystectomy surgery, um, it's one of the things that we need to ligate. Um, to identify it, we think about something called the Callis triangle. The borders of um, Callis triangle is superiorly is the inferior uh, border of the liver, uh, superiorly, inferiorly is the uh, cystic duct, and um, Medially is the um, uh, hepatic uh, duct. And that is something that we try and delineate in uh, laparoscopic cholecystectomy surgery uh, to try and identify the artery. Next slide, please. So uh, last question for the day, we have a 52 year old Caucasian male who presents as GP with dysphagia that started on relating to solids, but now has progressed to liquids. Biopsy of his esophagus, esophagus reveals dysplastic cells with evidence of glands and raised mucin, which of the following in his history is likely to have contributed to this condition. So um, I think most of you have said C. I think the correct answer is A, obesity. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about why that's the correct answer in a second. Okay, so esophageal cancer. The main two types of esophageal cancer that we have is either squamous or adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is the most common worldwide. It tends to affect the top two thirds of the esophagus. Smoking is the most important risk factors in both types of these cancers, whether the squamous cell carcinoma or um, um, adenocarcinoma. But there are other factors that are important to include in squamous cell carcinoma, which is the high alcohol intake, achalasia, high intake of hot beverages, and increased uh, dietary nitrous amines as well. However, in adenocarcinoma, next slide, tends to be a progression of um, Barrett's um, esophagus, which is caused by gastric reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease, which has an association with obesity. And that's why obesity is the correct answer in this case, because the question mentions the raised mucin, which tends to be related to the esophageal adenocarcinoma. And as this, um, this slide is one of the risk factors, is kind of the obesity and the gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. Smoking is still one of the key risk factors as it is for the other type of cancer. Um, however, adenocarcinoma is the uh, leading cause of residual carcinoma more in the Western world. So Squamous is the one as we've already mentioned worldwide. And it tends to affect the lower third of esophagus, which could sort of make sense as it's associated with um, reflux and Barrett's esophagus. Okay, and I think that's the last slide. Amazing. Thank you, Namir. That was really useful. I hope everyone else enjoyed that. Um, I think it's also if everyone can do the feedback form, that would be really appreciated. And I think Jesse's been watching the Q&A while that talk's been going on. Um, so if you've got time to answer any questions, I'll see if Jesse's got any to ask you.
yeah of course yeah, we've got quite a few actually. Um, so if okay. we can stick around for, for a while, so we can kind of get, get some of these answered, thank you. Um, so yeah, our sure. first question is, um, is, our, uh, is a PR examination indicated in a small bowel obstruction? Uh, so uh, obviously the PR examination is not gonna tell you direct information about that it is small bowel obstruction. Uh, just to be sure, is the PR examination indicated in small bowel? That was the question, wasn't it? Small bowel question, yeah. So, uh, but obviously we're talking about kind of an assessment uh, of the patient who presents with a distended abdomen, you would include during a PR examination. Uh, so it's just the slides, I try, try to present them in the way that you're getting the information rather than more directly to do with the diagnosis that comes at the end. Great, thank you. Um, and then the next question would, is, um, when would you utilize gastrographin versus CT contrast for small bowel obstruction? Um, so, so because I line keeps cutting, but I'll just repeat the question, when would you use gastrographin for small bowel obstruction? Is that correct? Uh, yes, versus CT contrast. Yeah, so uh, there are a few uses for gastrographin. So one is if the CT does not show the definitive diagnosis or shows findings that we are not sure about. So if you can imagine that if you get someone to swallow some contrast and it does not flow all the way, then you're quite sure, yes, there's an obstruction. So probably the CT finding that we have that was a bit indeterminate is probably an absolute obstruction. The uh, second use is that uh, we tend, um, sometimes the clinical picture is slightly improving, but it's not definitive. For example, the patient is yet to open their bowel, so we're not sure whether they, the obstruction is still there or not. We're talking about someone with adhesion or small bowel obstruction that we look at them clinically. They've got better, but their bowels are not open, but they're not vomiting. So we're not really sure. They seem to get better, but we're not certain. So we do the gastrographin study just to see if the, the obstruction has resolved. And there's a new approach that's coming through, um, that's being used more often as well, is using gastrographin as a therapeutic thing. Uh, some people will argue there's no evidence for this, but a lot of surgeons will say there is. So we've noticed something that um, you give someone gastrographin with a due small bowel obstruction and somehow the gastrographin does help relieve the obstruction as well. So it has a few uses that you can do, but obviously mainly we just think about the diagnostic uses as well the diagnostic uses mainly. That's interesting, thank you. Um, and then next question is, what is a CT colonoscopy? So CT colonoscopy is essentially, it's a CT scan, uh, but it's better at looking at the bowel wall. Um, it is, we do it for patients who we think would not tolerate or would not be fit for an endoscopy scan to have a colonoscopy, or for sometimes it's patient choice, they don't, have, they don't want a camera test. Um, it does involve uh, kind of um, making the bowel slightly bigger to get better images of the wall. So it's a slightly more specialized CT scan. It's not your typical CT where you just put some contrast and, that, and um, take some images. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question is, uh, can you tell the difference between diverticulitis and colon cancer on examination? Diverticulitis or bowel cancer on examination, how we can tell the difference. Um, so, that, so whenever you think about any type of cancer, you think about a chronic picture. That's not just bowel cancer, any type of cancer. Uh, and pain tends to be a late feature of most types of cancer. Okay. So if you think about bowel cancer, diverticulitis, diverticulitis tends to present with pain tends to present with temperature and uh, tenderness in the abdomen in the left iliac fossa most frequently. And when you do your basic investigations, you have raised inflammatory markers. So that is kind of from your basic examination and tests, you can kind of differentiate between the two. That, that would point you more towards diverticulitis. If it's leaf is bowel cancer, then from your basic, from your um, examination, you might feel a mass. Uh, abdomen generally tends to be soft um, and then your basic examination you might have pictures of microcytic anemia low mcv and a low hemoglobin as well um, so it's just thinking about dactylitis is more acute while cancer tends to be more chronic obviously and you normally get the answer when you do the definitive test just as a ct scan 
Great, thanks. And kind of just following on from that, one of them that we've had is um, uh, for chronic limb ischemia, why clopidogrel and not aspirin? And would you consider uh, dual antiplatelets in the short term? So why clopidogrel? Um, I'm not sure exactly, but I'm just sure it's related to the evidence. Um, I know there's kind of, when it comes to cardiovascular diseases, there's a question whether it's um, at, Kind of aspirin or clopidogrel and things like that. Do your platelets you tend to use more with more directly cardiovascular diseases more often than um, other things that are related to peripheral vascular disease and things like that? Okay, sorry, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Great, thank you. And um, we can make this our, our final question then. So, um, would laparoscopic repair normally be used for recurrent hernia and why? Would laparoscopic repair be normally used for recurrent hernia and why? Um, so it's just going to depend, really. Uh, I can't really say for, um, uh, but as you can imagine, you'd, you'd like to do it laparoscopic because the mesh is already lying on the inside. Uh, but really with hernias, it's really quite dependable on each surgeon. So it's quite variable. Um, I can, so for example, in my trust and the surgeons I've worked, the consultants I've worked with, they do a lot of them um, um, open. I can't remember the last time I've seen a laparoscopic. So it's just really quite variable. I don't want to give you an answer, uh, but that's it. As in uh, definitive, I think different people give you different answers. Uh, but I think if you can imagine when you do it laparoscopic, the mesh is already lying on the inside rather than on the other side. So it will just really depend on the scenario and what procedure was done at the time that you will help you decide how to do the recurrent uh, hernia. But I'd imagine you'd be more lenient to do it open. Perfect. I think that's probably going to be the last question for today. If there is any more okay. questions in the Q&A, um, would you be okay if we just email them to you? Yeah, of course, quite happy. And you can share my email, quite happy, don't mind. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for today's lecture. I think it's been really useful and people seem to do quite well on the questions. So hopefully people have learned uh, something today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. And yeah, I hope you found it useful and we'll hopefully see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.